And we're live. Are we live? Are we on? We're going to do this. I'm going to give it just a couple more minutes to let everyone who wants to join us join us. Are we live? Are we on? Please look around our homes. We're live. While we wait, I'll get them to 30 <laughs> seconds, maybe. <laughs> All right. 10 seconds, nine, eight. All right, hi there. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Beth Spotswood, Alta's digital editor, and I'm delighted to introduce you to our first ever Alta Asks Live. This is a digital version of the bookstore discussions we usually host throughout the state. This conversation is gonna last about 30 minutes. So if you've got to step away, don't worry. We're recording this and we will publish the video to our website, altaonline.com. Today's guest is journalist and author, Bonnie Soy, a longtime contributor to the New York Times, California Sunday Magazine, and Alta. Bonnie is here to discuss her brand new book, Why We Swim. And she's going to discuss that book with Heather Scott Partington, writer, teacher, and critic. Heather's work has appeared in the New York Times Review of Books, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, and of course, Alta. We are honored to have them both as we kick off our first ever Alta Asks Live. We'll actually be back doing this next week, same time, 1230, where Heather will discuss um, books and her deceit and other possibilities with author Vanessa Hua. Right now though, Bonnie Soy and Heather, take it away. Thanks Beth. Hi Bonnie. Thanks Beth. Hi Heather. So I'm so excited to talk about this book, Why We Swim. Um, Bonnie Soy's Why We Swim is, um, are we calling it a memoir in essays or are we calling it a collection of essays? It's everything. Uh, I, I, I resist memoir only because I'm a journalist and I, maybe there's like a memoir frame around it. <laughs> it um, deals with uh, Bonnie's own experiences swimming. There's science, there's uh, meditation there's research, um, it's wonderful. I enjoyed it so much. So I'm really excited for us to get to talk about it today. Me too. So before we get started, just how are you doing during this strange time? It's a really weird time to be launching a book. <laughs> um, I think a lot of uh, writers um, are feeling that way. You know, this was a big season for books. And um, I think just the aspect of it um, being a time where you, after years of, of just solitary work, that it's, it's usually supposed to be a celebration, you know, you're out in the world, you're interacting, you're talking about the thing that you've been thinking about in your head for so long. And um, at first, it definitely felt sad to kind of realize as, you know, and, and things keep evolving. And, uh, and so, it's, a, it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride, but it is, um, it has been heartening how um, we have been finding different ways to connect and being creative about it. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, you know, like for case in point, what we're doing right now um, with uh, you and Alta, and I'm just really grateful. And so that feels really good. And the response to the book has been pretty great so far. So, knock wood. Good. Have you been uh, swimming? Have you been able to find ways to make that happen? Or is that kind of on hold for right now? It has been, again, like, it's like whack-a-mole, you know, you're just trying to find the places that are still open and still accessible to you in a safe um, way. And so far, I've been able to get in the ocean very, very early, like right first light. Um, either at Ocean Beach or down in Pacifica. Um, it's easier at Ocean Beach because there's just, it's four miles of, of beach and it's not this problem of congregating in a parking lot, one parking lot for the whole beach. And so, um, you know, I'm trying to find little windows when I can and, and being outside walking with my family. The funny thing about being at the beach is that, um, you know, even though some of the beaches I know in the state have been closed that uh, because you know, people have been coming so close together. When I go out so early, actually, it's like the, I don't see anyone. I, it's, it's for, it's, people are further away from me in the water and, and on the beach than, um, than I'm walking down the street in my neighborhood. So I kind of try to be sensible about 
um, getting outside um, and then also knowing that it's a balance of things that we're all trying to do right now. Mm -hmm. um, great. So I, uh, one of the questions that I was wondering is um, what central question kind of guided your research and your writing with this book? You know, I struggled a lot actually with the structure of the book. Um, I just thought about it for a long time and before I even ever wrote anything down. And um, so I started collecting these stories, this, these intriguing stories about swimmers and, and, and survival stories and, and different characters in the book. People would just kind of, I told, I would tell people that I was thinking about doing a book about swimming and they would have things to tell me. And so I would just start collecting them. And um, a few years ago, I realized I had all this great material, but I had no real organizing principle. And then a really smart um, editor friend of mine said, you know, you have some great stuff here. Why don't you just call it something as simple as why we swim? And I, it, I kid you not, it was like a religious moment because everything kind of fell into place where all of the, all of the research that I had been doing, the stories I've been collecting kind of fell into these five different thematic categories. And the first and foremost, of course, is survival, because without, you know, that's why we're doing it. We're doing it to survive the water. And then once you can survive the water through swimming, then swimming becomes, can become so much more. And so that's sort of what the progression of the book is about. Great. Um, what, I know that you did a lot of research for this book. What, what things from your research surprised you? as you uh, started to delve into different areas? You know, um, a lot of the science, um, I would talk to different researchers and scientists um, around um, the human body and how it, it handles cold water immersion. So that was something that people had, there's been a lot more research into how our bodies respond to water, specifically cold water. Um, we, we've all kind of, we've known for, many hundreds of years that um, at least anecdotally people would write from you know Euripides to um, Byron you know they, people would write about the the salutary effects of the of the water and particularly ocean immersion and things that you know we talked about the water cure for for centuries um, but we didn't really know what we were talking about <laughs> in terms of why that happened. And so the science is only kind of beginning to catch up, but I was really surprised by the research being done um, in recent years that kind of shows that we, everything from a phys physiological standpoint to our um, psychological responses to seeing water, being in water, looking at water, uh, being around water, um, so that our bodies will respond to immersion, of course, in various temperatures, and it's very beneficial. Um, but also that even just, um, and this is pretty uh, timely right now, is that you can feel better. Um, you have a sense of calm. Our set points, our are, are, are human um, uh, set points in the brain are really set to the environment. Right? We know this now with the natural environment and the blue spaces um, are particularly calming for us. And we know that from just the way the patterns of our brain waves are when in response to seeing water or listening to the ocean or hearing um, just uh, being around it is beneficial. And so I was really in, interested and fascinated by all of these very specific ways in which our bodies and our minds respond to water. Does that change what your swims are like now? I mean, has, has that research, does it enter your head as you're swimming? Does it, I know that you probably, I mean, you write about swimming from the time uh, you were really young and right. it was really something that was enjoyable to you. Has that changed your training or your approach or, or just even what you're thinking about as you're swimming? I, you know, I started to think about a lot more things when I was swimming. So I used to just completely go blank. I would just focus on the laps. I would, um, I would think about what I was doing with my stroke. And now it's more of a meditative thing. I think I allow my brain to wander and because I would just start noticing or, or try to, I would, I would break out of my, you know, out of my writing, uh, stink, you know, hunch. <laughs> and then I would head to the pool and I would ask myself while I was writing this, book 
um, I would ask myself during the swims, like, what am I thinking about? Like, what, where is my brain going? And I would, you know, I would ruminate on everything from the feel of the water to the guy in the next lane to how many times does a bird poop in the pool when I'm in it? You know, I just like so many things that you just, and, and it made me realize that it was freeing to be swimming in the water. Um, and that it allowed me to actually be more creative and make those connections. And I know um, in the book, you write about um, some changes to your training that you did. Um, mm -hmm. You talked about joining um, a master's program. Can you just talk about what that is? And so sure, so have an idea. Um, so the master's swimming, US master's swimming program is, um, I mean, it's a, all these club teams, uh, basically for everyone who is not in a college swimming program. So, after, you know, 18 and up, you can um, join. And it's basically a swim team for grownups. And it's every level. You can swim just practices. You can learn to swim. Um, you can be a relative beginner with swimming. Um, and they will be, ref coaches are there to refine your stroke. Or if you are a former competitor that you can, there are so many meets um, nationally, regionally, nationally, internationally, and uh, there's just this wonderful community aspect of it. And so I grew up swimming club from when I was uh, eight to 18, basically. And it was ingrained in me to be swimming with a coach barking at me all the time. Mm -hmm. And I, it took me years to get rid of that and, and allow myself to swim without feeling like I had to always be doing something better or doing sets. And, and so then for this book, I joined a master's team. I joined a team again for the first time in 20 years. And I thought, do I really want to be swimming with someone yelling at me again? And I just, because I don't like people telling me what to do. <laughs> and so in, in you, but in this context, it's, it's really, you realize that you welcome it. You welcome the feedback and you also welcome the, the camaraderie of swimming near and with other people. Mm -hmm. So that's that's been, I actually really miss my master swimming community so much. And so there are a lot of swimmers who live in my neighborhood. And so some of them will walk by and shout from the sidewalk and say, hi, you know, we'll talk from my, my front door to the sidewalk. And so I, I do get a little bit of a fix um, in that way, but I really, I really miss them. Yeah, it's hard. You talk um, about some uh, kind of local um, people who inspire you and, and some people from your research. Um, your research is definitely full of trailblazers. Are there, are there some um, favorite um, stories that you have in the book, some things that really, um, some people that you feel like really affected you? Definitely. Um, well, locally in San Francisco, I spent a lot of time with um, Kim Chambers, and she is a world record holding um, distance swimmer. And so she's a, I guess what we, what we would call marathon swimming. And so she was the first woman to swim from the Farallons to San Francisco. So for those of you who are not as familiar with the Farallons, it's a, it's a, I, uh, islands uh, 30 miles outside of San Francisco out the Golden Gate and it is the middle of the ocean it's open ocean it's you know thousands and thousands of feet deep and it there are sharks <laughs> uh, around there and there was a shark research station there for a long time and um, you she you get dropped in there and then you're expected to swim back uh, find your way back to San Francisco and she did that and the thing that um, is so important amazing about her is not that particular feat, but that not that long before she, um, that period of time where she was training for the swim, she almost lost her leg to amputation. So it was, she only discovered swimming several years before because she um, was rehabbing her leg and she was learning to walk again. And so she had an accident where she fell down the stairs of her apartment in San Francisco and um, she developed what's called leg compartment syndrome. And so that um, the pressure builds up in your leg such that if you don't get, relieve the pressure via surgery within enough time, then you, then you will lose your limb. And so um, she was 30 minutes away from amputation in the hospital and she, the doctors didn't know if they could save her leg. 
and they did and she spent two years relearning how to walk and in that period of time she started swimming and not because she was a big swimmer um, but because when she was a kid in New Zealand she remembered the feeling of being free in the water when she was visiting her grandparents um, and going to the beach and just feeling so trapped by her body's limitations that she started to swim and she started uh, to swim in a pool and then she started to swim with the dolphin club um, in San Francisco Bay and that just changed her life. And it turns out she's freakishly gifted at long distance swimming and, and that was, um, it healed her in a lot of ways. Um, you meant you just mentioned the Dolphin Club, and I don't remember the name of the other one, but there's another club. Oh, Dolphin Rowing Club, yes. Yeah. Um, can you just explain to people what those are, people who don't live in San Francisco? <laughs> sure. Um, they are, uh, let's see, I think that they were founded, well, they were founded in the 1800s, and they're these very traditional, uh, I think they're rowing clubs, of water, like water sports clubs um, where you would swim or take watercraft out and um, there are a lot of Olympians uh, on their club their roles and over the years and um, now it's just it, it what it means today when you when you talk about South End or Dolphin Club clubbers is that they are these you know cold water swimming crazy you know amazing people who who would that's their medicine, that's their tonic, right? So that they go out in the mornings or in the evenings and they, um, they swim in the bay. And they, you know, right now the clubs are closed, which is, you know, I think pretty tough for a lot of people who that's sort of how they maintain their equilibrium in life, right? And then, and, you know, again, like there are so many um, things that we've been taking for granted. And, and now with the, with the situation with, this virus is that we realize that we are we are very blessed and we're very lucky to have all of these things available to us and so I think um, I think the hope is that we come out on the other side with a renewed appreciation for all that we have uh, with where we live and the access to that and so um, and for health and just like well-being just to be able to you know hug a friend without being scared that something you know bad will come from that and I think that's a pretty it's a pretty strange inversion of what we're used to. Um, and so I think that's what's been so upending about, about um, this whole coronavirus crisis. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so I wanna shift gears just a little bit. Um, we talked, we did a written interview about um, other disciplines that inspire you to create. And you said that you like to listen to music while you're writing. Can you just talk a little bit about um, what, kinds of things you like to listen to. Sure. Um, I, I mean, especially when I'm writing something that really demands a lot of focus. Uh, I can't have things with words. <laughs> and so I make this playlist, this writing playlist, and I like to listen th to things on loop. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of get, I think it's probably akin to swimming laps, you know, mm -hmm. over and over again, you just really get into the state of flow, which is what we're going to talk about a little bit later in, in this um, conversation, but uh, that, that it is meditative. And so it pulls you into a place where you can just, um, the thoughts keep coming, you know, and, 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 uh, and they come sometimes unbidden in, in, the, in the best way. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, you know what? I just realized that we were supposed to start with uh, a giveaway. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Bonnie has some beautiful art that um, she's going to be giving away. So I'll let her talk about uh, how we're going to do that. Well, I thought since we couldn't actually all be together and talking and breaking bread that um, I would, um, a friend of mine uh, told me about a, a, a British designer friend of hers named Alexandra Brown, and she makes these beautiful um, decorative tiles that um, depict swimmers, and she made a special set for the book. And so I thought I would do a giveaway for this tile. Um, I guess what we could do is that if anyone is interested in entering the giveaway, just to tweet at us um, at Alta Magazine um, or me or Heather online, uh, and we will see who enters and then we will pick a winner. So this could be yours. Beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> um, so um, why don't we have you read a selection from Why We Swim? Um, so I'm gonna read from 
the end section of the book that's called flow. Um, and flow is really about, you know, not just that meditative state that I was talking about where you're so immersed in activity that you just kind of, everything else falls away and you just kind of do it on autopilot. And it's so enjoyable that you lose sense of time, but also in this like more physical sense of swimming, like you could swim and, and, and enter this, automatic state that also is um it's a mind and body experience in the way that i talk about in the book and there's so many different ways um to explore that as well um so i'm going to start here when it comes to swimming we can understand flow to mean not just the expansive timeless state of being that psych psychologists define but also the flood of thoughts that swimming enables and the connection we have to each other and to the planet we inhabit flow from Old English, flowin, from the same root floar, Old Norse floa, to flood, and Dutch, to flow. The word holds other secrets too. Latin, plorare, which means to weep. Sanskrit, plu, which means to swim or bathe. Old High German, fluin, to rinse. Greek, fluvil, <laughs> to swim. Float. I followed the downstream movement of language, and it offers up a raft of connections. Flood, weep, swim, bathe, rinse, float. Trace this lineage and it reveals an unfettering, an unburdening, whether physical, a release of the body to water, freed from its customary weight and gravity, or emotional, through a good cry, the cleansing release of tears. In the sea, a tidal flood of water traveling from thousands of miles away can absorb a small individual burst of a dam. Elation may be essential to the flow state, but so too is a slice of sorrow embedded in the very history of the word itself. Even in grief, the breakup of uh, the great, bleh, even in grief, the breakup of my parents, a miscarriage, the death of a friend, I have marked time by water. I won't linger on these sorrows because I don't mean to say that swimming cured me of them, but I will say that swimming in all of its permutations, in a pool, in a lake, paddling a surfboard out to sea, has always helped me come out on the other side of a difficult time. The tides keep changing twice a day. Water is in a forever state of flux. To swim is to witness metamorphosis in our environment, in ourselves. To swim is to accept all the myriad conditions of life. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, I just wanna thank you for this book and for putting your words out into the world. I, As I was rereading over the last couple of days, I was really um, just moved by the, the physicality of your description of swimming and, and also, it just made me feel this sense that, um, you know, when we're in the water, we're connected to so many people throughout history and to our biology. And um, I live in Northern California too. So the landscape in Northern California um, that you wrote about, it, it's just wonderful. And um, I can't recommend it enough. Um, so to anybody who's out there, who's looking for a good pandemic read, <laughs> Why We Swim is wonderful. Um, and we're gonna go to Beth right now um, because she might have some questions for us. So hi, Beth. Hi, guys. I actually, um, I don't have questions. I only have lots and lots of compliments. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take them. Yeah, lot, tons of compliments for both of you. Um, so I just, I want to thank you both so much. Author Bonnie Soy, moderator Heather Scott Partington. For those of you who tuned in late, don't worry. We will publish this interview in its entirety at altaonline.com. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us. If you have feedback, if you've thought of a question and you want us to get it to Bonnie or Heather later, um, or you have requests of other people you'd like to see at Alta Asks Live, email letters at altaonline.com with feedback. Um, the next Alta Asks Live will feature author, San Francisco Chronicle columnist and Alta contributor, Vanessa Hua on Monday, 1230 Pacific time. Um, and again, tweet us at Alta Journal or tweet um, Bonnie or Heather if you want a chance to win those gorgeous custom tiles. So thanks to everyone, everyone for joining. We really appreciate it. And we will see you next week. Same time, same place. Take care.
Hey, and I've 